this content triggers you, you'll never survive the end times. The deep end. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, gas prices are through the roof, and they're probably going to go higher as of today. Good thing the military is focused on more BLM diversity training, and the vice president has strong words in support of more equality. Do Christians support Vladimir Putin? The news media seems to want us to believe that. And what does Putin want? We're going to open up the deep endopedia because it's important that we get the facts and discuss Ezekiel 38 here on your favorite night of the week, The Deep End, on Tim Hatch Live. Did I say Putin? Putin, not Putin, Putin. Anyway, welcome on in, everybody. Let me know in the comments below that you're watching and make sure that you hit that like button and subscribe button and all the other things that you got to hit to make sure that you get notified. Oh, here's my phone. On your smartphone device every time we go live because you never want to miss an episode. It is episode 19 of season five on the deep end. My name is Tim, your somewhat humble host, still working on being the most humble person on the planet. I'm close but I'm not there yet. I want to talk to you for a moment on the mission of the deep end because sometimes I wonder, well, why am I doing all this? Because you know, it's a lot of work to put these shows together and I hope that you appreciate them. Let me know below or just let me know by liking the video. What does the deep end exist to do? I want to put the mission of the deep end here up on the screen. Here's the mission in clear language, engaging culture with discernment, not argument. Engaging culture with discernment, not argument. Let me tell you why that matters because don't we all get tempted to get into deep, hotted, or heated, <laughs> hotted, heated arguments with friends, family, coworkers, neighbors over politics or over religious stuff or over whether Jesus is the only way, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this show is hopefully helping you to engage culture with discernment, not argument. I, what I mean by that is I don't want you just to argue with your friends. That's, that's not the point. I don't want you just to talk about how awful the world is. Look, the world is awful. The world has been awful since Genesis chapter three. I mean, that's what the Bible talks about clearly is Genesis chapter three is the problem. Let's just, let's just go back to the original problem. It's not, not white people. It's not colonialism. It's not Britain. It's not America. It's not, you know, whatever it's, it's sin. Okay. So when we talk about culture, we have to talk about it in the framework of Genesis chapter three, the fall and everything developing from there. And that's why on the heels of the deep end, you have the deep dive tomorrow night. So join us for both the shows because we'll talk about culture tonight, but we talk about the Bible tomorrow night and, and both are meant to go together. Remember they used to be one show and both shows are meant to go together so that we not react to culture. We, we discern, we discern, we don't argue, we discern. How are we supposed to look at the world? Because Every single day, the world gets more and more ridiculous. And that is a beautiful segue into this edition of Ridiculous News. Ridiculous. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about Joe's crack pipes. Remember Joe's crack pipes? <laughs> little play on uh, words here with Joe's crab shack, if you're from the South, Joe's crack pipes. Anyway, this is from the Free Beacon Press, uh, Biden administration to fund crack pipe distribution to advance racial equity. We talked about this a couple uh, episodes ago that basically about $30 million is being sent in of taxpayer money was being used to buy clean crack pipes and needles for drug addicts and being distributed on the streets of American cities because we don't have enough clean crack pipes for all the crack smokers and heroin shooters out there. So you, taxpayer, needs to pay for them to do it safely. So our complicit state-sponsored uh, news outlets, like the Huffington Post, made sure to run cover for Biden, saying, no, 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 that's not true. That's not what's really happening. And so this article was online real quickly. Biden administration slaps down crack pipe funding after right-wing misinformation spree. And so they made sure, let's run cover for dear leader. 
even though, <laughs> funny thing is, even though the article at the Huffington Post absolutely articulates that the funding actually exists for quote unquote safe smoking kits and supplies. Have that here on the screen. Quote from the from the Huffington Post, quote, the grant description stated that funding may go toward quote safe smoking kits slash supplies, which include crack pipes, as Republicans have said, but that's hardly the focus. And the cynical GOP misinformation leaves out why medical experts endorse such an approach. Yeah. So while they tell you that it's not happening, they actually tell you that it is happening. It's just kind of funny. Same stuff, different day, double talk from the media elites who like to create the narrative to foist our country into impending oblivion. Honestly, this is unbelievable. So I investigated that little link there that you see on the Huffington Post article, the grant description. If you click that link, you can go to the article, you can click on it yourself. It'll lead you right to the uh, Department of Human uh, Health and Human Services harm reduction grant that is available to the taxpayers <laughs> to read and peruse for themselves. So here's um, page 10 of the Department of Health and Human Services Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. That guy on the left, we'll get talking to him about him in just a moment. Look there, uh, bullet point, purchase equipment and supplies to enhance harm reduction efforts such as, and then scroll right down there and you will see, what do you see? Safe smoking kits slash supplies. So uh, the guy on the left, this guy is in downtown LA. He's not a crack smoke, pope, uh, smoker. He, he's a, a good man. And he's reporting live on the scene of LA to show you that Joe's crack pipes are already showing up in downtown LA. And you'll be amazed at who, <laughs> the delivery system for these crack pipes. Watch this. Crack. So That's every crack. Tuesday That's and crack. Friday yeah. in Hollywood, um, they have That's a Catholic different. church That's that crack. gives this stuff out. Um, this is where we live in at y'all. And this is what the government is doing. Uh, Joe Biden said he spent $60 million on paraphernalia for drugs. And this is what it looks like. It says being alive. This is a meth pipe. Yep. Right here with this bubble thing. I guess you put the meth in there. Mm -hmm. This is a crack pipe. Yep. Okay. These are all instructions on how to overdose treatment and education. These are. This is the needle in here. I'm not going to open this. I'm scared. That's for heroin. Yes, yeah, for heroin. It has the alcohol. That's pads a real and stuff. needle. It's yeah. a needle in there. Oh my god. And um, these things are like a, a black and mild filter that you put on the crack pipe so you don't think no one's saliva, so you don't get sick, and you can do your drugs. And, so, this is so they like it. it. So they like if you're gonna do drugs, we're gonna give it to you so that you can do it the proper way without getting sick. Because we're, we're not, because we're not stopping drugs. it. We're not, we're not gonna stop it. Exactly. This is letting you know that it's gonna be here. This is what they. Yeah. Thank you to whoever that guy is reporting on the streets and exposing what the federal government is doing to our country, funding with your taxpaying dollars, uh, funding. Um, crack pipe distribution on the streets of LA. And did you notice the mints that were in the bag? They had mints in the bag. They put mints in the bag so that you don't have bad breath after you smoke the meth. Uh, that's what, what's happening or, or crack, whatever, however you do it. I don't know. And the Catholic church is the distribution center. <laughs> Talk about having a form of godliness and de denying the power thereof. Amen. Like second Timothy three, I think that is a form of God that is denying the power of literally partnering with a federal government that is empowering more and more um, drug use in our country. Now, an important question, again, engaging culture with discernment, not argument. Where do these ideas come from? What, where do the ideas that we should fund clean pipes and clean needles for drug users come from? The Huffington Post talks about this, and, and, and there's a few experts, experts in the federal government that considers these uh, crack pipes and needles to be akin to condoms for safe sex for teenagers. In other words, the mentality is, well, they're going to do it anyway. Teens are always going to have sex. So give them condoms um, paid for by the taxpayer. So drug addicts are going to do drugs. So give them free, clean needles and so on and so forth. And I only bring this up to illustrate something for you to understand as a Christian. This is how the world handles problems that are rooted in the sinful condition. This is, and by the way, this is probably the best the world can do with addiction and enslavement to the flesh and the things of this world. Because in, according to the world, when you take sin out of the equation, as our country has very successfully done, no one's a sinner. No one is a sinner. Everyone is a victim, a victim of their feelings, a victim of harm, a victim of their addiction, a victim of, so everybody can play the victim card. No such thing as sin anymore. And, and whenever you do that, <laughs> you create a deteriorating society. 
So let's make it easier. And this is how the world handles these problems. Let's make it easier for them to remain victims safely. No empowerment, no freedom, and no deliverance. Like this, but again, Christians, don't get mad. Don't get upset because this is the world being the world. This is the world being the world. What do you think? Let me know in the comments because it's important to me to get feedback from you. You've got to address culture with discernment, not argument. But it is unreal what we see. And at the same time, it should be um, expected as Christians. It's a reminder. It's a reminder. And this is an important reminder. Are you ready for it? Only Jesus sets the captives free. Oh, what, what do you have? You have drug users on the streets of L.A. right now. The Catholic Church is literally <laughs> handling them the needles. And the Catholic Church abandoning, whatever Catholic Church that is, not the entire Catholic Church, but that particular Catholic Church, abandoning the gospel and using worldly means to solve spiritual problems. This is why I do what I do. This is why the deep dive, deep end is here, because we've got to get to the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The government can subsidize our ability to destroy ourselves. And it will lead to higher taxes and larger federal government programs that will do more damage to humankind than good. It has happened for decades in this country. Our political arguments are right down this very line. Do we hand more of our lives over to a growing, inflated federal government, or do we self-govern as the Constitution stipulates, reminding ourselves that the Constitution only works if we can govern ourselves. Sadly, we are seeing that the demise of America is rooted not in the wrong political party being in power, but in our abject failure to empower people in the gospel, empower people in the scriptures, as we used to do, as we used to, we did, we did at one point, we did honor and respect churches and Christianity in this country. We did at one point have our children praying in public schools, learning the Bible in public schools, and we didn't have these problems. Well, we had other problems, but we didn't have these problems. And it seems like even the problems that we solved after we took the Bible out of public schools are back, such as racism and segregation, <laughs> which is happening on, an aver on a reverse kind of ideal from the 1960s in that we have separate graduations now for um, people of color. <laughs> which I don't understand at all. But anyway, not to demonize the world, just to show you that you've got to see politics. You've got to see culture rightly. Friends, we're Christians. We, we, we love the sinner. We love those who oppose us and, and disagree with us because we're not enemies of people. There's a spiritual enemy that is at work behind the scenes. And we cannot be ignorant of what's really going on. Unfortunately, while we love the sinner and even love and serve those who disagree with us and hate us, we are going to continue to be, con continually be demonized. Uh, there is only one religion in the world that is fair game for our media to demonize and ostracize, and that is the Christian religion. And I, th that brings me to the deep end commentary. When you don't know what to do. All right, I want to talk to you about this. The media's never-ending quest to produce anti-Christian propaganda. And it's there. Ask yourself, when was the last time a Muslim was portrayed as the villain in the movies? When was the last time a Hindu was portrayed as the villain in the movies? It's, it's always the biblical Christian, right? You know, just, just go to like Shawshank Redemption or um, Rock of Ages. These movies that always portray, oh, those fundamentalist, bigoted Christians, those Bible-believing, bubble-thumping Christians, they're always the bad guy, right? So there's this never-ending quest to produce anti-Christian propaganda. I bring you to the Washington Post. Look at the headline. The Washington Post, in the middle of all this Ukraine War. The bond that explains why some on the Christian right support Putin's war. So here's what they want to do. They want to basically tie Christians to Putin. Why? Because Putin is now the bad guy. Putin is now the warden in Shawshank Redemption. And so let's lump all Christians in with him. Now, I will stipulate that in the article, it says why some on the Christian right, not all. But nevertheless, the article is hilarious for many reasons we'll get to in a moment. But consider this other article from The Guardian, Vladimir Putin, a miracle defender of Christianity or the most evil man? <laughs> It's like, okay, so he is a defender of Christianity and the most evil man. Like, they're so close, we could we can't distinguish which one he is. 
This is, again, the media's quest to create and propagate anti-Christian propaganda because the God of this world hates the gospel and those who believe it. And, and so the God of this world is in charge of the structures of this world in many respects, and he orchestrates and demonizes Christianity, to orchestrates those organizations to demonize Christianity as often as he possibly can. But let's go back to this Washington Post article because it is hilarious. Here, here's one of the quotes from the article. It says, white evangelicals once saw Russia as an existential threat to traditional gender roles and sexual morality. So there they go, right to genitals again. And it's going to be all about genitals in this article. But over the past three decades, they have forged a partnership in global family values in a global family values movement that not only embraces sexual and gender traditionalism, but sees these practices as a solution to demographic changes around the globe. Now, I, I've read the whole article so that you don't have to and you don't want to, trust me. The writer just continues to run through this history of Russia and Christianity over the last 100 years, basically forgetting that Russia for 90, well, for 79 years was the most anti-Christian country on the face of the earth, obliterated religion, closed churches, enacted um, military forced <laughs> conversion and, and uh, propagation of atheism to its citizens. Um, interestingly enough, little little tidbit about Russia, Soviet Russia, after 79 years of government-sanctioned atheism, the percentage of atheists went from 5% of the population to 6%. So it's an astounding 1% growth after almost 80 years of uh, government propaganda to disbelieve in God actually only produced one percentage higher of disbelief in God amongst its citizens. Why is that? Because you can't stop the gospel. The church went underground. The church continued to spread the gospel through. They used to share pieces of paper. Lots, lots of great stories about Soviet Russia, the Christians who were underground during that time. Same thing is happening in China right now and other countries. Uh, you can't stop the gospel. The gospel will always go forward. Amen, amen, amen. But anyway, the, the writer runs through a hundred years of Russian history to show how communism once embraced progressive sexual morals, which is actually not true, <laughs> but they do reference abortion and divorce, which were permitted under communist Russia. But then that pesky fall of communism happened, the writer basically says, and the churches were reopened, people came to Christ, and mission organizations flooded the nation, bringing the gospel. Now, the result uh, at, at the fall of uh, communist rule was, again, it, that is true from the article, Missionaries from this country and others went into Russia in full force and brought the gospel. And the result was mass conversions during the 1990s. And I remember I was in Bible college at the time and we used to have missionaries visit us on a regular basis um, during missions week at, at college. And they would talk about that the door, the, the uh, iron, what was it called? The iron curtain? The iron curtain coming down has literally produced a revival in Russia. And there was just a hunger and thirst uh, for people of Ukraine, people of Russia longing for the gospel. It was finally available. And what a, what a powerful um, t a t testament to what happens when you let the gospel be preached freely. Anyway, the result of preaching the gospel in Russia during the 1990s and early 2000s was a stronger moral standard than the United States. So as Russia starts to increase its moral standards regarding sexuality and gender, the, the United States does the exact opposite and starts to plummet into what we are now in right now. Cultural confusion, sexual confusion, gender confusion, all this kind of nonsense. And the government, as we report in this show very many times, the government becoming a wedge between mom and dad, a wedge between parent and child, creating more and more divisions, not unity, divisions. And then she writes about how Boris Yeltsin and Putin found that the growing Russian Orthodox Church could be a tool to unite the nation around their values and create patriotic elements that will eventually be leveraged for their own political ambitions. And she's not wrong about that. But then she, then she literally jumps from the growth of Christianity in post-communism post Russia to, you're not going to believe this, January 6th. <laughs> Again, don't read the article. I read it for you. It is just such a piece of propaganda. And I don't know how these people get away with it, but they do. Well, I do know. I've already explained it. The God of this world. The God of this world is in charge, and he puts these ideas in the eyes of into the minds of the ignorant and, and anti-Christian amongst us. So we have to expect this as Christians. The world will hate us. Matthew 24, 9, Jesus said, you will be hated by all nations for my sake. Don't forget that Jesus never promised us to be loved. He, he, by the people. We're loved by God. And because we're loved by God, it's okay if we're hated by people. Amen, right? That's, re that's really true. But I, I report on this because it, it really is 
And I said this to my church a couple of weeks ago. It is like I get to talk about the end times in real time because <laughs> every nation is ramping up as anti-Christian sentiment. And in America and in the West, it's a soft, it's a soft bigotry, but it is growing. It is a subtle increasing bigotry through the educational system, through the governmental growing federal government, through uh, the, the media, Hollywood and the entertainment industry. And um, mind you, mind you, by the way, these Washington Post types who write these kind of articles will be the same people who champion Muslims getting elected to Congress and consider that advancement, progress, diversity, equity, equality, whatever. But that's a religion, by the way, where they still execute gays. They throw them off buildings in some, in some nations. It's where they treat wives as property of their husbands, while at the same time demonizing Christians, the Washington Post, for their evangelism that leads to social order and traditional family ethics. It's called hypocrisy. Now, back to Putin and the war, because this is really what I want to delve into when it comes to the deep end uh, commentary. What does Putin really want? What does this guy want? And I think there's a great piece from the Atlantic, the Atlantic Monthly from uh, 2013. The title of the article says, How the 1980s Explains Vladimir Putin. And this article does a nice job because you have to remember or you have to learn that Vladimir Putin was a KGB officer in the USSR glory days. Okay, he was the, what's the KJB, the KGB, KGB was the mere organization of the United States CIA. So the KGB was pretty much like the secret spy organization of Soviet Russia. And he was a part of the organization, but instead of taking, and this article talks about this, instead of taking a low entry level position in Moscow, he actually got a higher position, but it was in a remote base in East Berlin uh, called Dresden, I believe. And the conditions in Soviet Russia were deteriorating quickly during the 1970s and 80s. And everybody could see the writing on the wall. There was no way communism would work. And again, socialism and communism never work. History has proven this again and again and again. It never works. But anyway, the conditions were deteriorating in uh, Moscow and in uh, you know uh, geographical Russia. But, but their base in East Berlin and, and other places around the world were prosperous, of course, because they were funded by the federal government, <laughs> bigger federal government, and they support their military and so on and so forth. So the experience that Vladimir Putin had of the USSR was far more pleasant than the rest of his countrymen. So when he thinks about the USSR and communist Russia, he, he has it in, he, he sees it in rose colored glasses, so to speak. So he's, he's, he's in East Berlin on assignment. And guess when he's there? He's there during the fall of the Berlin Wall. And so the Berlin Wall comes down. He's in East Berlin. And what does he see also? He sees the glory of the USSR fall as well. But he sees that disconnected, intimately at least, from the problems that communist Russia Produce. So he doesn't see the bread lines. He doesn't see the impoverished victims of uh, a centralized federal government that oversees everybody's life constantly. And uh, this article quotes from uh, Vladimir Putin himself saying, quote, the Soviet Union had lost its position in Europe, although intellectually I understood that a position based on walls and water barriers cannot exist forever. But I wanted something different to rise in its place and nothing different was proposed. That's what hurt. They just threw everything away and left. Okay, that's that's from Vladimir Putin himself. So he's he's a rising officer. He's a he's an important officer in Soviet's most powerful military branch, uh, and he's undercut by his government's leadership, at least from his position, uh, as they surrender a key position in Eastern Europe to the West. And remember that the USSR, Soviet Russia, was once a conglomeration of fifteen. Countries, right? This is a picture. Let me put a map up on the screen. This is a picture of what the USSR was. So there's 15 countries, Russia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia. Now, now I don't, I'm not going to go down the whole list, but understand that he already, or not he, but Russia already invaded Georgia and still has troops there. They are now invading Ukraine and um, they also uh, annexed the Crimea, that little peninsula off the bottom of Ukraine there at number six. So what is he doing? 
what what is Vladimir Putin doing but trying to reclaim the glory days that he was familiar with through at least his lens in the eastern in East Berlin in the 1980s and early 90s. And mind you, this is all happening as at least until today the US was getting 10% of its oil from Russia. Now I hear that today uh, Joe Biden is now cutting that import off completely because the politics of it were inescapably bad for Joe Biden and his administration. So we literally are funding this war, this invasion, through our need for gas. Now, there is another side of the political aisle that says, let's drill here and let's let's open up our uh, ability to uh, excavate oil from our own ground. And then there's another part of the the, um, American argument, which is we need to go clean energy and electric cars. In fact, I think that's what Pete Buttigieg, the the transportation secretary said. He said, ah, if you're worried about high prices and gas, just buy yourself an electric vehicle. No problem, right? Yeah, even though the electric vehicle production has massively slowed because of the supply chain crisis and further complications due to inflation. But here's what we do in the deep end. We go a little bit deeper. Did you know that Russia produces 20% of the world's nickel. Why do I say that? Because nickel is a key ingredient to the batteries used to power electric vehicles. Russia is the third highest nickel producing country in the world behind Indonesia and the Philippines. And why is he invading Ukraine? You're not gonna believe this, but you need to know it. Ukraine has the world's seventh largest coal reserve. Second largest in Europe, seventh largest in the world. About 34 billion tons of coal exist in Ukraine. Why do I share that? Because you don't get electricity without coal. And you don't get electric vehicles without electricity. And you don't get electric vehicles without nickel in their batteries or coal to empower them and charge them. And by the way, they also cost way more than traditional gas powered vehicles. So as our out of touch elites continue to rule and dominate us, Putin continues to go after these natural resources in Ukraine and the glories of the USSR to bring back his, you know, what he saw as an amazing time in in, uh, Russian history. And our country suffers the highest gas prices ever and loses key footing in uh, the global political landscape, geopolitical landscape. It's amazing, isn't it? And some of you might be like, thanks for frightening me. Thanks for making me more and more scared. Uh, that's not why I come to this channel. And I understand that. And, and if you would just give me a like or the subscribe because I still want to help you out here. I want to, again, give you discernment and understanding. This is why we've got to go to the word of God, ladies and gentlemen. The word of God already mapped this out for us. And I shared this with my church. I'm going to share that here, uh, share it here on the deep end. You got to go to Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 talks about all of this from 2,600 years ago. Ezekiel prophesying uh, during the exile to Babylon, uh, Israel is exiled into Babylon because of their sins. And while while there, there's a prophet named Ezekiel who's raised up, given the words of God for the future that is to come, not just for Israel, but for the world. And not just for ancient Israel, but for future, present day Israel. Ezekiel 38 talks about this. Let me just put it up here on the screen. It says this, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face against or toward Gog, the land of, of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And prophesy against him. Now, just so you know, Meshach there, uh, the word Meshach can also be translated Rosh, and and that's going to be important in just a moment. So, nonetheless, prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Now, the question is, who is Gog and who is Magog? Gog means chief prince and Magog means ruler or expanding expanding people. That's important. So you're talking about the chief prince of an expanding people, a chief prince of a, of a people who want to grow, expand over the world. What does God say? Skipping down to verse 15. Here's what it says. You will come from your place out of the where? Uttermost parts of the north. Don't miss that. You 
and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army. Verse 16, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me when through you, O God, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So what is he saying? What is Ezekiel prophesying? There will become, there will come a leader, a chief prince of an expanding people from the north of Israel who will come down and invade Israel in the latter days. And God will use all of this to vindicate his holiness before the people. How will it end? I'm so thankful that Ezekiel didn't say there's going to be an invasion upon the people of Israel and it's going to be bad. No, it actually ends very well for Israel. Look what it says. Verse 21, I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother with pestilence and bloodshed. I will enter into judgment with him and I will rain upon him and his hordes and as many people who are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Now, what you have to know about this is this is all uh, Revelation uh, 20. Uh, terminology here literally almost word for word about the judgment that happens in revelation 20 at the end of the millennium is happening here in ezekiel chapter 38 to gog and magog now the question again is who is gog and magog and i submit to you that it is some prince over the northern nations of israel the northern or nations north of israel which ironically (laughs) if you look at this map next is russia and ukraine look directly north of Israel. What do you have? You have Russia, you have Ukraine, you have Crimea, you have Poland over here, you have uh, Kazakhstan, you have all these former Soviet republics right to the north of Israel. And if you trace all these lands back to the uh, table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, you get this, um, this picture. So Gomer, which is list, all these nations are listed in Ezekiel 38, 5, and 6. You have Gomer, you have Put, Cush, uh, Torgum, uh, Tagorma, and Tubal, Persia. That's Iran, Magog, again, over here in uh, USSR, Communist Russia, and Rosh, which is also the other word for Meshech, which was in verse 2, I believe. Uh, yeah, verse 2 of Ezekiel 38. So all these nations listed in Genesis chapter 10. Um, all these areas, what, what do they do? Uh, what do they surround? They surround Israel, don't they? And if you ask yourself honestly, how do these nations feel about Israel? They don't like them. By the way, interestingly enough, in Ezekiel 38, he talks about that they're going to come upon a people without walls, a peace-loving, peaceful people that are well secured. By the way, Israel is presently well secured through the Iron Dome that literally obliterates any missile attack in the air before it even has a chance to get over Israel airspace. It's unbelievable. These people don't need walls. They have superior technology that protects them. I'm sharing this with you so that you understand that this is not something that should catch us off guard. We are well aware that God has already mapped this to take place. He's already mapped it out in the word from Ezekiel 38. Now, now some people might be saying, are you trying to tell me that Vladimir Putin is the Antichrist? He is Gog? No, not at all. I am trying to tell you, though, that he is a picture of the Gog figure that is to come. He is a type. You have to understand biblical interpretation to get to this point. The Bible often uses types and shadows to point to the archetype or the ultimate revelation of what all those types and shadows pointed to. For instance, David and Moses and Abraham all pointed to Christ, or Isaac really pointed to Christ. Abraham points to the Father. But nonetheless, so all those types and shadows point to Christ, who is the ultimate Moses, the full and true David, the true Job, the true, you know, Moses, deliver all those people. Well, I also believe that the New Testament presents types and shadows of the Antichrist, the one world dominant leader who will turn all the nations on to against Israel and invade. And so I believe what we are seeing right now, hear me out is Vladimir Putin is a type or a shadow of the one world leader yet to come who will turn all the nations against God's people Israel in the last days. And the good news of all of this is that they will not succeed. They will not succeed. They will fail. God will vindicate his holiness. Who knows if that's not how God brings Israel to repentance back into the fold and they are saved and they are, you know, the evangelists for the, for the last days. And then the glorious return of Jesus Christ happens. And that all depends on your eschatology, your end times view, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-millennial, amillennial. I've talked about that ad nauseum on this channel before. Go and check out season two of the deep end. It's all there. But listen, 
Here's a great question. Ready? What about America? Because most of you live there, right? Most of you live in, in this country, the land of the free and home of the brave. All these events, if we go back to the map, all these events are in the center of human civilization. Remember, human civilization probably started right around this area. And I believe that it's all going to end around that area. I think that human civilization ends where it begins. So the question, again, what about America? Here I am in the West, far detached geographically from that region. What's happening? Well, here's what I think is happening. America is the Babylon of Revelation 18, the whore of Babylon, if you will, that Revelation talks about um, infects every other nation and injects every other nation with sexual morality and um, m massive greed and corruption. And that's exactly what we have here in this country, growing exponentially, uh, being propagated through the school systems and the educational department, being propagated from our federal government, right? I'm going to give you a couple of examples. This is what you have to understand about America. I believe America will implode on itself just as the Roman Empire did before it. The Roman Empire did not get destroyed by the barbarians uh, or, or the, the, the Goths. Uh, before it internally rotted so that it lost its moral foundation on which it stood. And there is evidence that that's where America is headed. I, I, I want to show you this. This is a tweet from Janine Clayton. She's a do medical doctor, and she's part of the NIH, which, as you know, has really wonderfully handled the COVID situation. And she tweeted out, in celebration of Women's History Month, this, check this out on the screen, Women's History Month, uh, this Women's History Month theme of providing healing, promoting hope marks how far we've come as well as how far we must go. I invite you to check out some of the health concerns facing women today in the latest Women's Health in Focus at NIH. Hashtag her story. And then there's a website there and there's a picture of an iPad and she's looking at uh, Rachel Levine, the transgender man, the man who transgendered to a woman and now has a high post in the federal government health and human services department. All this is coming together, by the way. So <laughs> you have a medical doctor who works for the NIH and the federal government who is asking you during Women's History Month to celebrate a man who is really good at being a woman. Uh, all this reminds me again of Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creator rather than the creature, cre the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You want another example? Because I got a lot of them. <laughs> As the Russian military invades Ukraine and wages war, America's military is ramping up its efforts to, wait for it, wait for it, propagate more BLM advocacy in the military. <laughs> this is from Fox News. Navy's extremism training says it's okay to advocate for BLM at work, but not politically partisan issues. So, read the article. It talks about the fact that they are ramping up efforts to indoctrinate our military officers with uh, BLM's mantras and mindsets. Reminding, uh, now I want to remind you again that BLM has never really been about black lives. It's always been about destroying the biblical model of a family. It's always been about elevating and empowering transgenderism and confusion and queerness amongst our, ch our children and teens. And ultimately it's about redefining what it means to be human. I've talked about this ad nauseum on this channel. So our military, the American military, becoming the great whore of Babylon, as Revelation 18 <laughs> predicts, is infecting its military with confusion and uh, sexual deviancy. So what will happen to America? Again, the same thing that happened to Rome. It will implode on itself. It's just a matter of time because you can't, you can't keep pushing this stuff into the culture and expect good to come out, okay? The, the advocates for transgenderism will always talk about the suicide rates of transgenders and they will say, if we just accept them more, if we just accept them more, if we just accept them more, that's not true. That's not true. It does not alleviate the suicide rate. And, and, and Sweden knows this better than us because they're ahead of us on the, on the progressive spectrum. They're way ahead of us on acceptance of transgenderism and homosexuality. And the numbers of suicide attempts have gone up, not down, in Sweden over, that, over the course of that time. So the answer is not to accept it. The answer is truth, but nobody wants to receive the truth anymore. We just want to propagate, propagate, propagate this nonsense into our culture. Want another example that America is going to implode and turning on itself? Our precious Vice President Kamala Harris tweets out um, during, oh, this was on March 3rd, again, uh, during the height, heightened tension in Ukraine uh, with Russia invading. Here's what she says 
Let's send the Equality Act to President Biden's desk. We must increase protections for LGBTQ plus Americans across the country. The onslaught of state bills targeting transgender Americans and their families is wrong. So America literally, Americans literally cannot pay for gas. They have to choose between kids' clothing and gas right now. Gas is at an all-time high. Uh, Russia is invading Ukraine and our country which for some reason has policed everyone for the past 60 years is just basically hands off for who knows what reason. Um, And Kamala Harris believes that the most important thing right now is to make sure that there are more protections. We need to talk more about LGBTQ because, because we don't talk about it enough. We don't, we don't have a whole month celebrating it. We don't have a whole month of educating our kids about it. November, by the way, there's two months. There's one black, black history month. It's the shortest month of the year, February. And there's two months, two, one Pride Month in June and one uh, LGBT Education Month in November, which is going to continue to get ramped up uh, through this progressive administration that we have in the White House right now. America is imploding. And we're talking about this nonsense. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. All that to ask you this question. Do you feel a little less American every day? And I'm sure you're going to say yes. Let me know in the comments. (laughs) Do you feel a little less American every day? Can I tell you that that's perfectly wonderful? Perfectly wonderful. Here's why I think, again, engaging culture with discernment, not argument. Here's why I think this is great. All of it, God using for good. Because God is uprooting his church from its beholdenness to the greatness of America. We are not the people who want to make America great. We are the people who want to make Jesus great. Ooh, I took a shot at some of other some of the other people on this channel, didn't I, just now? We're not about making America great. We're about making Jesus great. And if America doesn't get great, that's okay. Let's make Jesus great. I I like America. I'm glad I live in America. I'd rather live in America than any other country. And I've been to many other countries. Let me tell you, we don't know how good we had it. But at the same time, as it deteriorates, as this progressive sexuality and confusion continues to escalate as we see our leaders literally handing over our dominant position in the world to our adversaries and enemies. I remember what Paul the apostle says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter three, verse 20. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our bodies to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Ladies and gentlemen, God is using this continued deterioration of our nation to draw his people out of it. What does it say in Revelation? It says, come out of her, my people. Come out of Babylon. And you need to do that. This is one of the best things that you can do right now is get informed about the the deterioration of America so that you can get rooted deeper into the the transformation of, of your Christian, of your, of, your, of your heart into Christ. Now is a time to connect deeper to your, Christian fa- to your church family. Now is a time for you to stop watching online church and get into church. Now is the time, more than ever, for you to get involved in the mission of the gospel and to bring the message of Jesus to the nations in partnership with those who long for his appearing. Let's shift gears because I have a question for you. Have you seen this guy? (laughs) Where where is Dr. Fauci? And that brings me to, oh, I love this segment. Are you ready this week in COVID crazy? If you have a physical covering with one layer, you put another layer on, it just makes common sense. Common sense. We've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin. Also, the science has changed. People should not be walking around with masks. Mask. <laughs> if everyone wore a mask, you could cut expected deaths in half. Because I represent science. <laughs> this week in COVID crazy. Pfizer and BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine protected just 12% of children aged 5 to 11 against COVID-19. A new report states from the New York State Department of Health. I give you this news from the National Post. That's what it says basically in the title. Pfizer shot protected fewer than 2 in 10 kids, New York Health Department admits. Quoting from the article, 
Here's what it says. From December 13th, 2021 to January 30th, 2022, among 850,000 plus fully vaccinated children 12 to 17 years of age and 365,000 children plus 5 to 11 years of age, vaccine effectiveness against cases declined from 66% to 51% for those 12 to 17 and from 68% to an astonishing 12% for those 5 to 11 years. Uh, by the way, the article goes on and states that it went down to 11% uh, in from January 24th to January 30th for children under 11 years old. This is as the COVID elites are foisting upon you vaccinations for your children. Although, again, where is this man, right? Where is he? Because it seems like COVID is suddenly over. And there's two reasons why COVID is suddenly over. Because people who are in power want to stay in power. And there is a midterm election coming up in November. And they want to convince the world that they solved COVID. Mind you, they'll bring COVID right back out when they need it to be back up. Because it's such a mysterious disease. It's such a mysterious, weird, hard to catch, hard to understand disease. That, um, you know, it comes back anytime it's politically expedient for the people who want more power. Remember as well, too, that this report, which I just put up on the screen, was from December 13th to January 30th. At the same time, that report was being found out by the New York State Department of Health that, that the COVID vaccine was losing effectiveness substantially over a 30-day period for our kids. Remember, I reported this on the deep end, that the New York legislation was arguing for detention of unvaccinated uh, citizens <laughs> At the governor's whim, there was a law on the books that would empower the governor of New York to detain unvaccinated citizens if they became a COVID threat to the rest of the society. This is the deterioration of the free nation of America in particular states. And it's kind of crazy to see happening as more and more exposure uh, is presented of Western leaders pretty much becoming authoritarians and autocrats in their own makings. There was an article circulate, not an article, a video circulating of Justin Trudeau. He was asked a question, which country did he admire? And the, the answer was astounding. And Justin Trudeau, the prime minister of Canada, here's what he said. Which nation's administration do you most admire? There's a level of, of uh, admiration I actually have for China. Their you know, basic dictatorship is allowing them uh, to actually turn their economy around on a dime. China. The man admires <laughs> China. And uh, we wonder why he shut down churches during the COVID pandemic. He, we, he arrested pastors. He um, used the banking system and emergency powers to seize bank accounts of those who protested his vaccine mandates in the trucker convoy. The West is becoming the East. Our cultural leaders are becoming an oligarchy. What is an oligarchy? The rule of the few that will disseminate information and misinformation accordingly to entrench themselves into never ending limitless power. And it is happening. And you need to know about it because it's a part of what COVID has produced. Did you know there's a guy named James C. Smith? You have to see this. This is a glaring example of how the oligarchy is taking charge. James C. Smith, put this up on the screen here. He is part of Pfizer's board of directors. And he's also the chairman of the Thompson Reuters Foundation, a London-based charity supported by global news and information provider. I mean, this guy is not just on the board of Pfizer. He's also the CEO of a major news corporation, nonprofit news corporation, by the way, called Reuters. That is one of the sources for many of the Associated Press's articles. And did you know, again, the National Post reporting that in the last year alone, Reuters has published more than 22,000 articles mentioning Pfizer and only 8,000 articles mentioning Moderna and 18,000 to Johnson & Johnson. Many of the articles about Johnson & Johnson were negative in sentiment, unlike their Pfizer reporting. So this is part of the oligarchy. This is what's transpiring right now. The rule of the few. This is exactly what China has. It's a con, kind of quasi-communist government where there can be millionaires and rich people, but you have to be you know, linked up to the right people in the right places, and that's exactly what's happening in the West right now. Why? Why is all this happening? Because this is what happens when you eliminate God from the equation of 
uh, a culture's life. This is what happens when people can no longer self-govern, when people can over, no longer self-rule. You have them handed over by God to the lust of their flesh, and that's where confusion and, and ridiculousness abounds. And then you have a few power players step up and consolidate power. And I want to put this on the screen because there is a movement to consolidate power of the population by elite players who want to run America as a pseudo-democratic oligarchy. And they have literally every news outlet on board. And that's what's happening. And you need to be aware of it. When you read the news, you need to understand it has already been, it has already been tainted. It has already been slanted for you to shape you. And you say, man, this is bad. What should I do? Here's what you should do. You should subscribe to the channel, like the channel, and make sure that you share this content. I'm going to ask you a favor. Do you have some Christian friends who need something like this? Their pastor's not talking about this stuff. Their, their church isn't mentioning this stuff. It's time for the church to wake up and start talking about this stuff. Pastors need to talk about it because, because it's the lives of people that we've got to care about. And all of this stuff affects us. And we just don't want to be ignorant of it anymore, right? And if you feel like I'm too dramatic, and I understand that, sometimes I get really dramatic because I care. Well, look, just have yourself some ice cream. Do what Joe does. Get yourself some ice cream and be at peace. Okay, so that's uh, that's the episode. <laughs> I'm glad that you guys were here. I'm glad that you were uh, taking time on your Tuesday night to be here on The Deep End. Remember to support the channel if you can through the Cash app or timhashlive.com slash support. And tomorrow we will be back with new content from Romans chapter 9 on the Deep Dive Bible Study. I will see you then. Check out the website, timhashlife.com. Order my book. Write a review if you would. I'd be so appreciative. But I'm most appreciative that you chose to hang out with me here tonight. God bless you. Happy Tuesday. See you tomorrow night for the Deep Dive.